good afternoon uh, professor jain so i am subramaniam and he's udit so we are here to we are here for some questions actually udit will start with some of the questions okay it's a great honor meeting you i am a present a masters thesis student working in condensement it's an inspiration actually to have a, a formal interview so i'd like to start by asking what made you choose to work in the field of let's say strongly correlated systems um, among many other fields uh, for example there was a revolution in high energy at that time what made you go in this career uh i would say it was kind of through a random walk that i found this field so uh, when i joined my phd at stony brook this was in 81 1981 and uh, it happened to be at the time when the quantum hall effect was being discovered so integer quantum hall effect had been discovered before that a uh, fractional quantum hall effect was discovered in 82 so i happened to be at the right time at the right place but you know like many people who went from india to united states wanted to do high energy physics at that time so um, at stony brook we had c n yang who is as you know a nobel laureate an extremely well known I mean, fantastic uh, physicist one of the greatest physicists of uh, the last century so i went to him i said i'd like to work with you and he said something and i'm going to quote him i don't want to offend any high energy people there he said and i think his views are kind of known by now he said well in high energy the party is over he said this is not the best field to be in uh, so he took me to a condensed matter colleague whose name was philip allen he introduced me to phil allen and then i started working with phil allen now phil allen used to do electronic structure calculations so he uh, and i kind of feel bad he has made fun of me uh, you know several times about this he gave me a problem to calculate and he says uh, i was a bad student i did not work on that problem but i worked on some other problem so he says at least you worked on something you know <laughs> so that was uh, so he wanted me to work on some quasi two dimensional superconductors uh, so there was a gap mode that had been observed in some of this so it's nivium diselenide uh um, so i started looking at quasi two dimensional systems and i started looking at plasmons uh and through that i kind of had an entry into two dimensions so i got to know people so there were these experiments from bell labs uh, aaron pinsher who passed away last year so i worked on his experiments and then at stony brook there was uh, steve kevelson who was uh, you know who is another great physicist uh, i so he taught me quantum hall okay so i'm i'm it's kind of a long winded answer but let me continue so um, i did some calculations on quantum hall effect with steve kevelson uh, but i was also very fascinated by fractional quantum hall so if you go back to that time there was laplace theory which was well accepted and it's certainly correct uh, there was another theory called the hierarchy theory which i could not understand so the folklore was that that explained the fractional hall effect but i could not understand it so i was thinking about it on and off so i was working on other problems you know like high field transport relaxation of electrons by emitting phonons and things like that but once in a while i would just sit down with some book on fractional hall effect try to understand it 
I was not working in fractional hall effect, just wanted to understand. And then this was in 1988 during the Christmas break. You know, we all want an aha moment. So there was a moment when suddenly things clicked, you know, because I thought, oh, I can understand fractional hall effect as an integer hall effect if I assume these particles. And from that point on, I started working. So I was not intending, it just happened and it was so compelling that I, in fact, I wrote the paper within a couple of weeks because I thought, oh my God, somebody else must be having this idea. I have to write it up quickly and send it. And so that's how I started working, started the project. So it was kind of just pure chance. Yeah, that's actually the perfect segue because we were the second question what we were about to ask was like yeah you can yeah what made you envision the theory of composite formulas to explain fractional quantum so yeah you yeah so it was I mean, so uh, there was uh, as I was saying. You know, there was a lot of phenomenology with fractional Hall effect and most people thought it was understood. And as you may know, in 1986-87, there was the discovery of high temperature superconductivity. So everybody and mass, you know, had started working in high temperature superconductivity. I was probably one of the very few people who was thinking about uh, fractional Hall effect. Um, but there were these ideas about anions where electrons are modeled as some flux bound to them. For high temperature superconductivity, there was the idea of semion superconductivity. So some people who, are, who have lived through that era, they know there was tremendous excitement because uh, there was this proposal by Laughlin that you bind half of flux quantum to each electron, it becomes a semion, and the pairing of semion is what explains high temperature superconductivity. So the idea that you bind flux quanta to flux to electrons was kind of in the air. Nobody thought about binding even number of flux quanta. Okay. So, uh, so when this idea occurred to me, and this was, I mean, I was doodling, and my wife still remembers, you know. We were sitting in front of TV, but I was just doodling and suddenly, you know, if you write, I mean, I explained in my talk today, the idea just follows. Once you have the idea, it just, you know, you get the consequence very quickly. So, again, I would say it was just a matter of luck. But, um, I guess by the time I started looking at it, there was no competition because nobody else was working on it. And, you know, these fractions which appear in sequences that was becoming more obvious. So earlier, people would think about each fraction separately. But by the time I started looking at it, it was becoming clear that they come in some sequences. And I guess that was one of the key things that probably helped me uh, Come up I guess uh, you could say this was the turning point in, in the research of the, the fractional quantum one. Yeah. It was one of, one of the turning points, it was certainly a turning point in my life, but in fractional hall effect, there were other turning points too. So Laughlin's theory was a turning point, uh, and I think this was also one of the turning points. But, uh, That's a well narrated answer, we enjoyed it. Yeah, okay. the next question we'll move on to the next question. So the next question is like, how would you uh, explain your research uh, to a non-physicist, let's say, who is not uh, working professionally in physics? Um, so I think it depends on the level of the person. So if uh, 
there is, let's say, an undergraduate student who knows something about quantum mechanics and who knows, so, okay, if somebody knows about electrons and magnetic fields, then there is, then I would explain it in one way, but if my mother asks me, for example, okay, then it would be a bit more challenging, I would say. But to an undergrad who, who, who is familiar with the idea of electrons, magnetic field, kinetic energy, and so on, I, I would explain it not too differently from the way I did it in my talk. Okay, so uh, um, I guess the idea is that there is a magnetic field, but electrons kind of swallow some part of the magnetic field and they behave, they see much smaller magnetic fields. At some level, that's the basic idea. But, okay, I, I think you have to, I have to know a little more about what the person knows okay, uh, before I can. Let's say they're a lay person, like you pick some uh, someone from 10th standard. Yeah. They have no uh, background in yeah. physics. Like, how would you motivate say, your research? Yeah, so in fact, it's somewhat simpler to motivate than many other things. So let's say somebody who is in 10th grade would know about Ohm's law. And they would know that there is current, you apply voltage. I think even people who are not, you know, scientifically oriented, we all know about batteries and current and so on. So Ohm's law tells you that the more voltage you apply, the more current you get. Uh, then there is this idea of superconductivity, which is that sometimes you can have current without any voltage. Now here, the idea would be that this is something amazing where the resistance becomes universal. You know, it does not depend on the details of the material. So that's, uh, you know, and it's same in whatever material you choose. Um, and then, so that's integer quantum Hall effect. And then what happens is that sometimes the resistance has a value which you they, it would have if the system okay to explain some of the quantized value okay the question is difficult yeah. <laughs> the question yeah. is difficult it's a it's, it's a good exercise to think about how you would explain things to lay people but uh, I guess the explanation would go along the lines that uh, to explain some of the phenomenology, you have to, you can do it if you assume that electrons swallow some of the magnetic field, and then you can explain. It. So they make a new kind of particle, which is, you know, electrons that have gobbled up some of the magnetic. This exercise of explaining to a lay person is in fact very difficult and yeah. Feynman famously uh, couldn't explain spin to undergraduates, so I guess yeah. it's, it's a bit... Uh, but Feynman also said, you don't really understand unless you can explain it to, uh, to your grandmother. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's also true. But Okay, Feynman would certainly be much better in explaining this than I would. Not this, this could be the best uh, explanation you give for the, the, relating it to Ohm's law and these things for the 10th grade. So, right. Right. Okay. Fair. Okay. Mm. So, next so the next, like, my final question is uh, when you left uh, to United States uh, to do your PhD, uh, like, how do you compare the situation then and now the the research in condensed matter theory in India? Um, okay, I, okay, I think there's no doubt that the research in condensed matter theory 
for all of physics is far better now than it used to be when I was a graduate. Although I should say that I, I mean in those days it was not common for people to do research, for students to do research while they were doing their undergraduate or even master's degree. And I believe nowadays uh, undergraduate students, they are much more involved in research and they have publications. You know, that's what I find from people who apply to graduate school at Penn State. So, okay, I think students know much more about what the possibilities are. They are much more knowledgeable about various fields. Uh, I mean, some of the applications that we get from India, they are like really, really impressive. But, I mean, they have publications and the kind of knowledge they have. You know, I say, I don't know these things. <laughs> So they have worked on many different topics. They have done term papers. They have done uh, summer research. You know, uh, so I think it's it's very exciting. I, mean, I, th I think when the talks we heard, really interesting. So I think the research is really looking up. You know, it can always be better, hopefully. You know, but it depends on. Uh, resources that are given to this field. Mm -hmm. Does that answer yes, your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. Now, uh, I think this set of question is completed. Yeah. Yeah, so, since I am a PhD student, I have some questions regarding PhD, so it should be useful for other upcoming PhD students. Mm -hmm. So, before that, we will have some uh, like fun questions. Like fun. So, what are the other uh, rec recreational activities you enjoy as a, apart from physics, which makes you like interested or intrigued in? So, if you can <laughs> share that, it would be. <laughs> I have a boring life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that is boring is subjective. So. Yeah. Um, okay, I like to meet people. And I like to, so one of the things I really enjoy is getting to know people from different cultures. Okay. Uh, so, you know, my wife and I, we spend, uh, we are not much of tourists, but we go to other countries and get to know the culture, the people and so on. Uh, another thing I enjoy is watching television. Okay. So I find that some of the shows people make are extremely creative. Um, no, it's especially, I mean, that's also a way to get to know about other cultures, you know, watching shows from different countries, you know, that gives you a lot of insight. Um, spending time with my granddaughters, you know, that's my favorite activity at this time. So that's nothing can beat that. It's, yeah, I mean, that's it's sweet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The next question would be like for PhD students. So, in during your PhDs, what were your uh, like positive and negative experience you faced in the PhD? Um. I think for me, that's that's an interesting question. I. I can't think of any negative experiences. So, um, I think it was all positive. So, my thesis advisor had given me quite a bit of freedom, mm. as I told you earlier. And uh, I was working on something, you know, I, I mean, so before you do your PhD or before you start doing your research, you know, it's somewhat theoretical. I mean, although you know that these things explain nature, but it's still theoretical. At least for me, it was theoretical. But then I did some calculations or Navan scattering from these quasi two dimensional electron systems. And then I made some predictions. And at Bell Labs, they did experiments and then they saw those things. And that was kind of an eye opener for me. I said, wow, these things actually 
described nature, you know. So, and in those days, I should say at least I was clueless. I didn't worry about which fields have more opportunities later on or where I would get postdocs and so on. I, I just followed your curiosity. Yeah, so which may or may not be the right thing to do, but you know, that's what happened with me. So then, uh, even for postdoc, we had a visitor, his name is Shankar Das Sharma. He was coming to give a, give a talk at, uh, at, at Stony Brook. And we were talking and he said, why don't you come and work for me as a postdoc? I said, okay. So somehow, you know, it all kind of worked out. So I cannot, I mean, I thought it was a lot of fun. I remember those days fondly. I cannot think of any negative experiences. Oh, all, all yes. Yeah, I'm just glad that you were not. <laughs> what would, how about you? Do you have negative experiences? Negative experience, you know, like same, even my guy is, uh, like, gives me so much freedom. Mm -hmm. So, so happy to work under him. So, I'm just going first year of my uh, end of PhD, like four, uh, four like second year. Mm -hmm. So, no negative experience till now. So, I hope it would be like this. I believe, I hope it will be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the, it's for general PhD students. And the next question, the follow up question is a lot of PhD students, like nowadays, they face uh, like uh, they uh, face the uh, stressful situations during the like research output or they might uh, stuck in some problem. Uh, so how did you handle the, those stress during the PhD? Or did you even had uh, any stress kind of that or it was like a uh, cakewalk for you? Um, so I personally do not I mean, maybe I was working on very simple problems, but uh, uh, I don't remember getting terribly stuck on problems, but I do appreciate what you're saying because sometimes my students, they're working very hard and the problem is not, you know, the idea is not being as fruitful as we would have liked, but still, you know, there is a point where you say, okay, let's drop it. But before reaching that point, you want to kind of explore all different avenues. And at that time, it can be a bit frustrating for the student, you know, because they think, okay, it's not working. But then you know, oftentimes, when you try hard enough, you know, there, things do work out. That's what I have noticed. Yeah, so. But for me personally, it um, <coughs> I don't remember any frustration. Okay, again, so, glad for you. Yeah. <laughs> In, yeah. So this is one of other question. Like, uh, when did you uh, like initially when you started your uh, PhD research? You were at a student phase. Like your supervisor would give you problem, and you have to work for them. So when did you realize that you had entered the independent research phase, asking your own questions and doing your own research from the student phase, like masters, then PhD student, then? So as I as I said, this happened with me right at the beginning. So my thesis advisor gave a problem to me, and I didn't work on that problem. So this was electronic structure calculation to explain some gap modes. But I found my own problem and uh, I, you know, now I think back and I, I think this was not the right thing to do because my thesis advisor must have, must not have been happy with this. But he <laughs> says, he says that it's one of the best things he did was to let me work on whatever I want. So, um, so I think I wrote a few papers during my thesis and I chose the problem in those papers. And I think I continued to do that for my postdoc onward. 
So, um, but you're right. I mean, for every graduate student, uh, there is a time initially when they think that they're working on their advisor's problems. But at some point, they take ownership. And at that time, they think, no, no, it's my problem. And then they start to have ideas on it. You know, so that's the transition point when they become independent, yeah. uh, you know, physicists mm -hmm. in their own right. You were like initially, you were the same from the beginning on. Okay. For me, it was, yeah, it started out. That's really amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. So, yeah. This is all, this is the last, like, couple of questions. Like, uh, what is your advice for current generation masters and PhD students? If you have, like, you don't know, some specified advice, like personal advice, if you would like to give. Uh, And that's again, having us an advice for everyone is kind of tough. Let, let me see. Uh, okay, work hard. That's really one advice. Okay. Because without hard work, you know, it's not going to work out. Um, uh, okay, one advice I would have is uh, we have to try to solve important problems. So, of course, if you're trying to solve something important, you know, you cannot directly attack the important problem, you know, you kind of work on problems around the corner, but Hope is that at some point it would solve this. So I think that's, you know. So, so I think what separates great physicists from good physicists is that great physicists only work on very important problems. So there is a chance that they would solve them, but others, there are a lot of people who do not try to work on important problems. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's one piece of advice. It's actually very important, more than enough. Is that was a valuable and okay. uh, was uh, working on important problems. And, but, um, yeah. What is your impression on Aisar Bhopal? This is the last question. Well, I gave my talk, and I was extremely impressed by the students. You know, because they were all asking questions during the talk, and they were talking to me after the after my talk, and they were all very curious, wanted to know. I, it was very impressive. So this kind of thing does not happen in US. Okay. I can tell you, you know, students are very reluctant to ask questions during the talks. Um, so I, I, I thought that was, I mean, I, that is the only interaction I've had with the students from Isar Bhopal, but it was very positive. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's all for the questions. That's all the interview questions. And if you have anything, you can. Oh, we will end on a yeah, positive we'll note here. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful experience, Professor Jing. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.